Hello there. I am Benjamin Coy, the Communications Marketing Campaign Manager for the National LGBTQ Task Force and the host of this series of conversations, platforming topics that aren't necessarily seen as queer issues, but certainly impact how we live and thrive. I am so excited for today's conversation and our fabulous guests, but before we hop into that, I have a couple of acknowledgements to make. First, I want to remind folks that the 2025 Creating Change Conference is right around the corner, and it is time now to register to join us. Make sure you go to creatingchange.org to learn more and register by October 31st to receive our special kickoff rate. See you in Las Vegas from January 22nd to January 26th. Tickets are now on sale for the 2024 Task Force Gala, so please make sure you mark your calendars and plan to join us in Miami on October 19th for a night for the LGBTQ community to get together, uh, unite as a community, honor our heroes, and support the work for advancing equality. Uh, please make sure you follow the Task Force Gala pages for more information, and again, get your tickets for October 19th. As we know, this election season is crucial, and it's important that we have all hands on deck. So we're asking you to join us in Queering the Vote. Log on to QueerTheVote.org to pledge and learn more. As we continue to host these conversations throughout the year, I invite you to let us know what intersectional topics do you think we should highlight? What things do you think aren't always seen as queer issues, but we certainly face? Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. So hopping into today's conversation, we are discussing bodily autonomy as a queer issue. Here's what we know. Bodily autonomy refers to the right of individuals to make decisions about their own body without external interference. This principle is crucial for all individuals, but especially for the LGBTQ community. According to the 2021 National Transgender Discrimination Survey, 33% of transgender individuals reported experiencing healthcare denial due to their gender identity, highlighting a violation of their bodily autonomy in medical contexts. Research indicates that LGBTQ folks who experience discrimination regarding their bodily autonomy are at a higher risk for mental health issues. LGBTQ people, particularly those who are queer and trans, often face barriers to accessing a reproductive health care. A survey found that 55% of LGBTQ individuals felt they lacked access to the reproductive health services that they needed. Criminalization of health care in some regions uh, is also rampant. Laws criminalizing certain health care services, like gender-affirming care, disproportionately affect LGBTQ people. In 2023, at least 20 states in the U.S. introduced legislation to restrict or ban gender-affirming treatments for minors. As of 2023, only 22 states in the U.S. have comprehensive non-discrimination laws protecting LGBTQ individuals in healthcare settings. This lack of legal protection can severely impact the ability for LGB LGBTQ individuals to make autonomous choices regarding their bodies and to thrive. Today, we're joined by two esteemed guests from Spark Reproductive Justice Now, Kay Good, the organizing director, and Lo Blackwell, the community organizer. Help me welcome them. How are y'all feeling? Pretty good. Good. Well, excited. Yes. Well, thank y'all so much for uh, chatting with me today. Um, let's hop right into it, shall we? Yeah, so, sure. as the political home for Black women and young people, tell us about Spark. Um, how it started, and what are your majors? What are your major focuses on? Okay, so our history is a little long-winded. I'm gonna try to make it shorter, but you know. Um, so Spark was born out of Georgians for Choice. Um, it's a coalition that was formed in 1986. Mm -hmm. um, it was to bring together like a number of women organizations to to greater, I guess, impact the protections and expansion of women's reproductive freedom in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2007, Paris Hatcher and Mia Minguez, um, two queer folks of color, founded Spark Reproductive Justice out of that mm -hmm. um, in order to like build and strengthen the power of our communities and a reproductive justice movement that centered Black women and queer and trans people in the state of Georgia and in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. um, and that work has like transformed in so many beautiful ways, um, even thinking about like the work that we do now um, that, I don't know, like invest in the leadership of our 
invest in the leadership and the development within our communities as far as like um, bringing them into the work, um, activating them, mm -hmm. um, serving as a space for them to kind of like just talk about like, I don't know, just all the things that are just difficult and hard as far as like being like um, a black person, a queer and trans person, a gender expansive person. Um, so like really want us to, we really wanted to provide a space where like folks can like feel safe and like share their experiences, but also, you know, we can politicize them and like skill them up and give them the language to be able to like advocate for themselves and their communities. So first of all, I want to start by saying thank you for continuing uh, that work. I know that it's not the easiest all the time, but thank you so much for sticking into it. And you really are truly making a difference. So thank you. If you have, if you don't hear it enough, thank you. <laughs> Now I'll start this one with uh, I'll start this one with low, and then I'll let you answer it as well, Kay. Um, well, in general, what does bodily autonomy look like for you? Uh, that's in general in your work. If it's personal, what does bodily autonomy look like for you? Um. So bodily autonomy looks for me. Um, basically having the freedom to make my own decisions um, with my body and express my gender gender identity um, without the fear of discrimination or any violence around um, being able to like walk into public places and just being able to like own my body um, as a person. Um, really just having the agency to live authentically uh, without any interference at all. Uh, yeah. I love that. I love those few words there. Agency and authenticity and safety. So there's three all, all together that that really uh, encapsulate that. How about you, Kay? What, what does that look like for you? Um, I think echoing low um, and also just thinking about, I don't know, just being able to live in a world where like I'm free in so many ways and the folks that I love and care about and that just like exist in my communities yeah. are free and have like access to choice. Yeah. Um, have access to like resources that they need and like require mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, abolition. I just really think for me, like bodily autonomy means so much. Uh, mm -hmm. I, was, I have so much energy. I had like some coffee this morning, but <laughs> but yeah, I'm just, I'm also just very passionate about this work. And like, mm -hmm. I just, I just really want folks to really just have what they need, including myself. Yeah. Um, but really specifically just thinking about the folks that are out there that we connect with, um, our community members, just like folks being able to have what they need. That's what bodily autonomy means for me. I love that. And I, I'd agree. I'd agree for me as well. It's it's having that agency to do what I want safely um, without discrimination, without bigotry, um, and just being able to support. True liberation is what we're all getting at. Um, so that's what it looks like for me, for me too. Now, you mentioned, Kay, a, a little bit about uh, being in the Atlanta community and just uh, how you serve your community. Um, and either of you actually can answer this one. Recently, a Fulton County judge struck down the Georgia uh, six-week abortion ban, calling it mm -hmm. unconstitutional. Uh, how does this recent ruling push the movement forward? Um, and or what does this do for your work at Spark? Um, so when it was banned um, as or deemed as unconstitutional, um, that was a great step forward, um, especially with the rally and all the processing happened, um, kind of gave us a way to move in growth. Um, but now, unfortunately, it has been taken away from us um, and or potentially being taken away from us. Um, being the six week ban being reinstated in the state of Georgia. Um, so. Yes, now it energizes us to continue to advocate and um, do better, I guess, when it comes to reproductive justice. Yeah. What are some initiatives that y'all are working on in the field, in Atlanta specifically? Okay, um, I can answer that question. But I also want to add to Lo, just really quick, if that's okay. Um, I think just naming that, like, yeah, like Echo and Lo, like, there's so much more work that needs to be done. But I think like this is really a great opportunity for us to really connect with like our coalition members mm -hmm. um, that we're connecting with. I really want to uplift the Am Amplify uh, Collaborative, which consists of different um, reproductive justice organizations, um, like coming together to really, you know, make things, make 
Make shit shake. I'm sorry yeah, if I can yeah. that. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, so really wanted to name that. Also wanted to uplift like feminist women, women's health, no, oh, feminist center. Uh, sorry, formerly known as feminist women's health center. Uh, but feminist center just like wanting to uplift like them being able to like get patients up to 20, 22 weeks along their pregnancy, uh, mm -hmm. get the abortion care that they need. Um, so I think that's really beautiful. Um, and then I want to go back to the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm trying not to say be too long winded, but uh, I think as far as like I'm thinking about some of the campaigns that we're plugged into. So I did want to uplift the Amplify Collaborative, but I also want to uplift like Fake Clinic Sup. That's one of the campaigns that um, we're diligently like working within um, that basically like kind of um, ignites the conversations around yeah. like anti-abortion centers. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of folks aren't really aware of those. So like anti-abortion center is basically a space where, where like the government has funded um, different centers to be able to basically like get folks to not get, like convince people to not get abortions. Mm -hmm. um, so they're like groups of like conservative folks that have come together, not really being honest about like them not being doctors or even having like the the experience they say they have to just be able to basically convince uh, convince folks to get to not get an abortion uh -huh. um, that really aligns with like what their beliefs are um, and basically like folks may come into a space thinking that it's a space where they can get an abortion or get care that they need and then they're like sitting there basically trying to get convinced or those folks are trying to convince folks to like not get an abortion. Um, you may see like even in your city, you may see like different billboards that say like, oh, need an abortion, call this number. Some of those are like fake like clinics. Oh, no. um, and the government like literally funds these clinics and it's so problematic, but also speaks to like one of the larger issues around like just abortion access. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah. Oh, wow. I, I never knew that those numbers were fake. So we're, we're learning a lot here. Mm -hmm. uh Okay, well then, with that being said, though, um, well, since you already kind of touched on a little bit about about that, what are some common misconceptions um, about bodily autonomy, about reproductive justice, about the movement uh, that you would want to clear up? Um, I think specifically, I was thinking about the about something that I saw maybe online somewhere, but I think like when folks think about like reproductive justice doesn't like include men. Mm -hmm. um but i think like it does obviously um i think when we think about like access and care all folks deserve like access and care to understand their bodies mm -hmm. access to gender affirming care just like, access to care in general um like speaks to like why rj is important for all genders all folks from different walks of life sexualities different disabilities like folks like it's just important to be able to like remember that like all these folks are included because typically like when we think about abortion and folks usually associate like with cis women and like just abortion access, but there are trans men that need family planning services, trans women that need that. Um, we yes. think about like um, folks trying to preserve sperm, uh -huh. um, folks trying to preserve eggs, IVF, um, the list goes on, right? So just really thinking about like that these things like all folks from different walks of life really um, deserve access to those things. It's not just, it doesn't just stop at women, right? right? And that's a lot of the work that we do at Spark to queer like these conversations and like just expand folks' like ideas around, you know, that there are more folks that deserve these things, right? right. Yeah, right, right. And when we focus on like the folks who are furthest from proximity to power, like we're able to get closer to liberation because everybody gets what they need. Correct. Everyone gets what they need. <laughs> Correct, correct. Lo, did you want to add something? I pretty much said it all, but I think it's important to understand that, um, like Kay said, regardless of, you know, your gender identity, um, your sexual orientation, your disability, all of those things, um, everyone has a right to make their own decisions about their own bodies and their lives, period. Um, and zoning in that or realizing that RJ is everywhere and in, in, in everything. Um, so yeah, she pretty much Basically, said everything. 
Yeah. And I want to highlight to, to again to what both of you just said that it is everywhere and everything. It's not just what folks have that tunnel vision on and what it means. It really does affect all of us. It really does. It really is an intergenerational and intersectional uh, issue that we're all trying to that we all need to pay attention to because you said, like you said, is correct. We all are impacted by it. So, with that, um, what changes do you hope to see in society regarding? RJ or bodily autonomy for marginalized communities. Obviously, we want it to be completely, we're all liberated, we all have the things we need, but what are some, I'd say, immediate changes, put it like that, do you hope to see uh, in society? I envision, you know, a society where marginalized people, that's including transgender and special folks who exist outside the binary, um, having full um, bodily autonomy. Um, especially with um, comprehension in healthcare, um, allowing, well, not allowing, uh, I would say having the knowledge, especially with doctors, they're needing more knowledge within like the trans bodies and other bodies that exist other than the cis um, bodies. Um, hopefully seeing that and fully realizing that um, each individual needs, you know, their own mm -hmm. uh, Reproductive rights. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Did you want to add? Definitely like access for like care for older folks, mm -hmm. um, like our elders. Um, mm -hmm. I think also just like access to even thinking about like just folks getting their name changed. Um, that's some of the work that we do as well, you know, with our power and a name campaign. Um, so folks being able to like have access to like be able to change their names easier, their gender markers easier. Um, and also just like, maybe this is large, but like just universal healthcare, like where folks are, everybody has access to healthcare. And it's not just like, oh, if you have a job or like if you're blessed enough to be able to afford to pay for this thing, just folk, everybody being able to like have access to care, everybody being, ha everybody having access to gender affirming care. I think when folks think about gender affirming care, they just think about like trans and gender expansive folks, but like gender affirming care is everybody has a gender or I mean, not everybody has a gender, but like everybody, whatever they choose to identify with, whether it's a gender or not, like they should have access to like the care that they want. And also just like information, like understanding like the information that's out there, because there's so much expansive like conversation and knowledge that go into that. Um, so I think just allowing folks to understand that and just like even like thinking about like I don't know uh rent being lower I think like when we have mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of conversations around like housing but like housing is like a reproductive justice issue as well so like folks being able to have access to like a safe home to live in mm -hmm. um I think that's just a basic human right to have shelter mm -hmm. food and just safety you know I love, you know what, I, and what I love about these conversations that I have every every month or so is somehow in the conversation, we always get back to how everything is connected. Our yes. is connected to housing and justice, is connected to criminalization, is connected to uh, this and that. And so I love that. And now I want to pivot, though. You, you mentioned the Power in the Name campaign. You mentioned some of the other initiatives that you're partnering with, with other organizations, Um how can folks get involved and support the work you're doing? Like, what's the best way uh, for that to happen? Um, so one great thing that's happening um, later on this year, November 15th through the 17th is our Justice Now 2024 conference. Um, it is a cross-movement power building and um, power shifting national conference that aims to provide an international and um well, international space for folks to unite for the advancement for reproductive justice. Um, and one of the ways that we have, like, or some of the things that we have is like workshops um, within our tracks, mm -hmm. um, education, action, and liberation. Um, we have our workshops coming in. Uh, Kay, if you want to finish. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, we also have, like, uh, we'll be doing a live recording of one of our podcasts, uh, Spark Off, where we'll have Raquel Willis um, and Erica Hart joining us, which that is really exciting. 
Mm -hmm. um, Tony Michelle Williams, who um, is the executive director at Snapco, will be our host slash MC um, during like our Spark After Dark. Uh, it's just so many amazing like things that are going on during Justice Now. So I would definitely say tap in if you're interested in um, potentially volunteering during Justice Now. That's a great way too. And yeah. Happen. Where is it? Where's it being hold held? Um, it'll be in Atlanta. I'm so sorry. Um, it'll be in Atlanta. Okay, perfect. And they can go to where? Where can they find more information? Um, if you go to our Instagram in our uh, link tree, it's right there. It'll be like subscribing to our newsletter, um, following us on Instagram, and also just like connecting with us on an individual level. Um, I'll be the first to like just put my information out there. If folks want to reach out to me, definitely email me. Um, K at Spark rj.org um if you're interested in finding a way to get tapped into the work we can direct you to whatever you're interested in whether it's like policy and advocacy whether it's like getting on the ground and like just being in connected in community um yeah just so many different ways to tap in so i would say start out by reaching out to us or even emailing info at spark rj.org <laughs> t-o-i spark rj.org wait say one more time T-O-I at sparkrj.org. Perfect. And I'll also include these all in the description box, y'all. So no worries if you can get it then. Um, now my last question, I will pitch it to Low and then I'll give it to Kay. Um, as I mentioned before we even hopped on or before we started, this work is tough. Um, and it really is a labor of love. Um, and it really is, it comes from our hearts, you know? Um, but it often feels like an uphill battle. And so what gives you hope? What keeps you going um, in the face of all these atrocities, in the face of all these um, horrible moments? What keeps you going? What keeps or what gives you hope? That knowing every challenge I face is an opportunity for growth. Um, and learning gives me, I want to say, Really, learning gives me hope and keeps me motivated to continue to do the work, um, especially no matter what I'm going through. It's just realizing that I can turn my doubts or any doubts or any situations into desires and making it happen. Okay. I love that. Um, I would say for me, um, definitely like, radical rest. So like really taking time to take care of myself and recharge myself for the work. Um, and that's a lot, some work that we hold at Spark as well. Like we have like a radical rest um, agenda and politic uh, to take care of each other. Um, but I also will say just like being plugged into like other community members that are doing this work um, and just like being able to connect with like community members and like invest in their leadership too. Cause I started out as like I heard an echo. Sorry, I started out as, um, you know, a college graduate. I didn't really know what I was going to do, where I was going to go. I was disconnected from family, and I had an organization that, like, really believed in, like, my leadership development and my growth. So every time I'm able to do that, I just really feel, like, really reignited to continue the work because, I don't know, I'm able to, like, make a change and a difference in someone else's life. I love that. Well, uh, that wraps us up. So thank you, Kay and Lo, for your time today um, and chatting with me, chatting with us. Thank you for the work you're doing and, and will continue to do for uh, not just the Atlanta community, but the community in general. Uh, we need you. Um, and I know that you all know that. I know that you are tapped in with that. So just want to remind you to thank you. And yes, radical rest is important. And I myself am just now learning that. Um, mm -hmm. So to all the folks out there, please rest is important. Rest is resistance. So please, please uh, capitalize on that. But again, thank you all so much for joining us. To learn more about Spark Reproductive Justice Now, I will have all the links in the, in the description box below. But please make sure you follow them, tap in, and support in any way you can uh, this wonderful organization. And also stay tuned to the Task Force social channels for more conversations, updates, and ways to bring equity and liberation to your community. See you soon.